to. So this is the other thing I think that the elite is concerned about. They have to keep uh, they have to keep this technology out of the public view until they can figure out some way to let it out into the open without it being proliferated in a weapons platform. Because if we're concerned about Iran now, then if this stuff gets out, we could be concerned about Bangladesh holding the world hostage. You know, basically, it's much easier to engineer. It's much cheaper. It's a multi-shot technology. In other words, unlike a hydrogen bomb, when you light one of those off, you've, you've used up your bomb. Well, you can fire this thing over and over and over. So it's a proliferation nightmare for, for the global power elites. And, and until they figure out a way to control the proliferation aspects of it, they're not going to release it. So they have to have a psychological operation to divert people's attention away from the development of this technology. And again, I think this is a convenient way to do it. Uh, let's look to ET and make this technology so exotic and so advanced that you know it's far beyond human ca capability, and therefore humans won't look for it. <laughs> oh, that's that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Now I've got another question for you. Uh -huh. You recently wrote an excellent analysis of a breakaway civilization, including thoughts on a secret space program that uh -huh. is perhaps indicative of a breakaway civilization, or as you just mentioned, civilizations, plural, uh -huh. and that the Japanese bear bond scandal may have had something to do with the funding mechanisms for yes. such. Could you just give us a synopsis of this, including who you consider might possibly be involved in such a civilization? Well, if we're going to have a breakaway civilization, I think you're referring to the paper I wrote um, for the members only area on my website. Um, and I, as I say, I'm writing I'm writing more papers on this idea, and and uh, hopefully we'll be posting them shortly. And, and uh, also I writing. Hope, a, I hope you realize I'm trying to plug your members only. <laughs> yes, I have, no, I, I no, I do, I, and I appreciate that. Uh, Good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm writing. Um, I'm writing another book, as I said, that's going to be dealing with this this whole f idea of a breakaway civilization and, and secret space programs and, and so on and so forth. But um, the bottom line for me, Uranus, is if if. Mr. Dolan's hypothesis of a breakaway civilization is true, and I think it is. Um, I think he's on to something there in a major way, and I think he's he's argued the case fairly well in, in his more recent interviews. Um, the problem with the breakaway civilization is largely one of funding. In other words, if we're going to be conducting the research to create the technologies that would make a civilization like that possible, then it's going to require a huge capital outlay, not only in terms of the finance of it, but also in terms of the human capital involved. In other words, the research technicians themselves. Now, in the case of the Nazi International, which I would definitely argue is precisely one of these breakaway civilizations, because if we look at the Third Reich in a certain way, it's mid the Nazi Party is midwifed into existence by certain secret societies inside of the Weimar Republic between the wars. The Nazi Party eventually takes power, of course, in, in Germany, and, and begins a, a crash program within the SS, which constitutes itself as a breakaway bureaucracy within the, the Nazi party structure. So you have a breakaway civilization giving birth to yet another breakaway civilization. And the SS, if you've read Albert Speer's uh, memoirs very carefully, he notes that the SS created quite literally a whole off-the-books parallel economy. Mm. And this, this in turn, is what I think survives World War II in the Nazi International. Because, my word, the Nazis made it out of Europe with a tremendous body of plunder and booty and loot from Europe, not only in terms of liquid cash, but in terms of other convertible instrumentalities like patents. Uh, they made it out of Europe with a number of technicians and scientists, which they managed to disperse all over the world and, and 
get them into various host countries to continue their research. So they had they had an inbuilt financial structure in place after World War II. All right. In the case of the American breakaway civilization, I think you've got two things going on. You've got, number one, a response to this Nazi international, and number two, it has to create a funding mechanism that remains outside of public scrutiny. Now, we know the standard techniques by which they've done this, the black budget, the overinflated prices on toilet seats and hammers and so on and so forth, but this still isn't going to give it a, a finance base large enough to conduct what I think its enormous costs would be. And the reason I think the costs are enormous is just look at the price of one B-1 stealth bomber. And that's, right. a publicly, that's a publicly known technology. So in other words, the costs of whatever technologies exist off the books that are unknown to us have got to be astronomical. So they've got to have astronomical figures for money. So... Enter the Japanese bear bond scandal. Why I think that might be connected, and, and again, there's no direct evidence that it is. It's just that the the circumstances of the whole thing are just downright peculiar any way you slice it. For one thing, you had billion-dollar bearer bonds in, in denominations of a billion dollars being counterfeited, which in itself is a suspicious activity because, number one, no such denomination ever existed in, in American securities. So either either this was a complete farce and a joke and a very bad one because, you know, any any anyone buying those things is going to attempt to verify their veracity. So it's either a very bad joke or it's a counterfeit of an instrumentality that actually existed. And if that's the case, then whoever's doing the counterfeiting of these billion-dollar bonds is sending, I think, a deliberate message. We know that something is up. And the reason I, I'm connecting it to space is that the Japanese, of course, had their moon probe, and they've been releasing slowly but surely their pictures of, of things on the moon. And they're... A little peculiar, you know. <laughs> There's no way of getting around it. <laughs> so, you know, I think that I think if we're going to have a funding mechanism for an American breakaway civilization, it's going to be in the fashion of a parallel financial structure, a parallel financial debt structure, and it's going to consist of precisely securities that are not well known that are off the books, it's going to consist also most likely of, of considerable amount of money laundering, uh, money from the drug trade, money laundering through things like huge large-scale ministries that, you know, put the cloak of God over, over the money and then launder the money that way. It's going to be laundered through all the standard techniques, in other words, of that intelligence agencies use to do this sort of thing. So, I, you know, the Japanese thing the Barabon thing just raised my, my suspicion meters immensely because the whole episode, Uranus, was so peculiar. These Japanese men acted like they wanted to be caught. Yes, with these, and with that with, yeah. message. Yes, and, and again, that's that's to send a message, like, as you say. And that, that, I think, was what was going on. Uh, it was, we know that there's a parallel financial structure that exists off the books and you know we know it because we've counterfeited the instrumentalities to it <laughs> yeah oh well thank you very much for that it's great yeah, you're thank welcome. you Uranus thank you and it um, doesn't help um, the Pentagon misplacing four trillion dollars in um, accounting trickery no <laughs> um, <laughs> Joseph what we'll do is um, we'll just have a quick three minute break and we'll be back thank you very much uh, all right all right Okay, we're back with Joseph Farrell. Um, his website is visadeathstar.com. Okay, um, Dr. Farrell, following mm -hmm. on from Alton, Andromeda, and Uranus's questions, something seems to be happening if you look up using third-generation night vision goggles. How close are, are we to a full-scale war? We haven't had the Carol Rosen asteroid scare yet, but Cliff's webbot sees the alien meme having a short-term peak in October of 2011. 
How close do you think we are to this event? Do you think it will be a Project Bluebeam, fake alien invasion scenario, or a true war, possibly a new cosmic war, as written in the Vedic texts and with myths like the return of Quetzalcoatl? Well, as for false fulfillment scenarios, um, I, I don't want to speak to that right now. Um, it's an area I've, I've been investigating with a friend. Um, I fully intend to write about it. It's very, very different, in my opinion, than what most people suspect. That said, do I think that we're witnessing a full-scale war going on upstairs? Well, the short answer to that, in my opinion, is yes, we are. Um, as to who it's a war between, that's a good question. Um, if we go back to to my hypothesis of a Nazi international that continued researching all of these black projects after the war, and if we further assume that they brought those projects to some sort of state of development where they were practical as, as an interplanetary technology, then we could be looking at a war between, quite literally, one faction of humanity and another. And I think that... Uh, that there's a certain amount of evidence that that might be the case. Um, is there another factor that might, ha might have interjected itself into that war in recent months or years? That's also possible, too. Um, there are people arguing that. The problem that I have with that hypothesis has been that there is no hard and fast evidence that that's the case other than statements of anonymous sources and whistleblowers and you know intelligence contacts and so on and so forth I think if we're going to argue that we have the best approach to do it would be to make some sort of inductive case uh, and that's very difficult to make even in terms of the assumption that we're dealing with human factions on earth fighting it out up there so short answer is yes I think that, that we are witnessing a war um, the hard question is between who and why, uh, and I really have no no answers to that other than, than raw speculation. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, Giuseppe, yeah, Giuseppe, you've got some questions? Uh, yes. Um, Dr. Farrell, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, from uh -huh. This is coming from Andromeda. Uh -huh. uh, her question goes this way. A question that I have is related to your interview in the Bite Show regarding churches and the religion that are based on the God God of death. Yes. Okay. I do believe that churches were built over energetic point lines, and I'm yes. fascinated that, that he mentions in the Bite Show interview about Genesis, giants, monsters, and men, mm -hmm. and that ancient temples promote alpha brain waves on people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, of course, makes people susceptible to implantation of ideas or yes. hypnotism. Yes. Could it be possible that the pyramid and other similar monuments are all part of the same network? And, uh, if you don't mind me asking the next one also, <laughs> and could it be possible that the intention of such network might or may be to harness the minds of people so we are kept in a state of virtual lobotomy. Hence, only few do something about the atrocities that are being orchestrated every day on this planet. 